us. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the June Igspo Town Hall. Um, my name is Courtney Lull. I am the chairperson for the Igspo uh, Board of Directors, and I will be moderating today's uh, topic of conversation. Uh, so we're just going to go through some general housekeeping and updates from IGFA. Uh, as a reminder, the town hall and dig deeper webinars can be found under the events tab on the IGFA website. Uh, if you have any ideas or abstracts that you'd like to submit for review to be included in our events moving forward, uh, you can do so. There is a, a tagged event at the top uh, that you can use for a form to submit any of those ideas or abstracts. Uh, we are booked for 2023 as of now, but are starting to look at 2024. Uh, we also have a new opportunity where you can actually sponsor these events. So if you're looking to get your information out there, uh, we'd be happy to have you join us as a sponsor. Again, same place. If you go to the events tab on the Expo website, you can see this tab right here uh, or the section where it says Town Hall and Dig Deeper Webinar Sponsor. And to a big uh, event that we have coming up, the IGSA Conference for 2023 is coming up in Las Vegas in December. Uh, the registration is currently live. Um, you can go to our website for more information. Uh, the exhibit space already is about a third full. So if you're interested in exhibiting, uh, get a hold of us soon. Uh, we'll go through a few of those. I want to start with thanking our sponsors. We do have a few sponsorship uh, spots available, one gold, one silver, and two bronze available, as well as our diamond sponsorship, but we couldn't do this without the sponsors shown here. Uh, so we just want to take a moment and thank to all of our sponsors so far. We really, we couldn't put this conference out without your support. Uh, as I mentioned, about a third of the floor, the exhibit floor is full. So if you have a product or a service that you'd like to showcase to the geothermal community, this is a great opportunity to do so. Uh, if you'd like more information on what it would take to be an exhibitor or have a booth at our conference, you can again visit our website, exhibit.org, for more information. Uh, we do have one last opportunity for the conference. Uh, if you would like to just show your support for the organization, you can do so with an advertisement in the program. Um, there's a multitude of sizes or levels available for an ad in the program. And again, if you check out our website and the conference information, uh, all of that information for the program guide advertising is there as well. Uh, our abstract submission session is closed. Currently, the Expo staff is going through those abstracts uh, and will be making decisions at the end of this month or early July. So keep an eye out for the conference schedule to come out yet this summer. Uh, one more event to really highlight is the IGSA Research Conference in 2024. Uh, this will take place uh, May 28th through May uh, 24th uh, in 2024 uh, in Montreal. If you'd like more information, uh, just keep an eye out on the newsletter or take a look at our website and we'll be putting up information more as that conference gets closer. So uh, just a reminder, these events do qualify for CEUs. Uh, if you would like CEUs for this event, just make sure that you send a message to the IGSPA account here on the Zoom call with your name and email address, and we will get that information over to you. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, please, any of the questions that you have, if you could type those into the chat function, I will be asking our presenter those questions throughout or at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you could also make sure that you mute your microphone unless asked to speak, that would be great. Uh, and then as a last reminder, these are recorded and put up on our YouTube channel for viewing later. Uh, one last bit of housekeeping as a reminder, the upcoming presentation represents the opinion of the presenter and does not represent any official position, opinion, or endorsement of any products or services by IGFA or its members. IGFA town halls and dig deeper webinars are for member updates and education on the latest information in the geothermal heat pump industry and are not meant to endorse one technology or brand over another. It is the presenter's responsibility to disclose any conflict of interest or position that may arise in the content of the webinar. And with that, I will introduce our speaker. Uh, as a reminder, if you could please mute your microphone, that would be wonderful. So I will stop sharing my screen and I will let Corey share his. So 
All right, here we go. Absolutely great. Uh, Corey Chin is here uh, as our speaker. He has over 20 years of experience in the consulting engineering industry, specializing in the design, construction, administration, and commissioning of mechanical building automation and plumbing systems. So with that, I will let Corey take it from here. Hello, thank you, IGSPA, for allowing me to talk. I know Terry Proffer was going to speak today, but uh, he was unable to make it, so he asked me to cover for him. Fortunately, I'm covering a project very familiar with, so this will be an exciting opportunity to share with you guys uh, our road to zero energy through the Pueblo Community Health Clinic's East Side Clinic. Recording in progress. Oh, what was that? Can you all hear me fine, Courtney? Excellent. All right, and you can see my screen? Yep, you're doing great. Here we go. <laughs> all right, why isn't it progressing? Maybe if you just click your mouse, it'll reset. There we go. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Our agenda today, understand industry terms for measurement of building energy use so we can speak about this stuff intelligently and help help folks understand some of these metrics that we use and how they apply to them. Learn about the process specifically that we applied to the East Side Clinic, how you can apply it to your projects, increase knowledge regarding goal setting, energy modeling, and integrated design. Understand how zero energy building strategies reduce the impact on the environment, impact projects bottom line, benefit the communities they serve, and the major contribution of decoupled ground source heat pumps uh, for building load sharing. I'm Corey Chin, as Courtney had mentioned, I'm a PE, CEM, CXA, <laughs> I've done a lot of uh, geothermal work since 2007. My uh, fascination and curiosity with building energy performance is really what has led to my involvement with uh, ground source heat pump system. Often I do this work in conjunction with Terry Proffer. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and speak to you all. All right, let's talk real quick. Uh, climate overview for Pueblo, heating degree days, base 65 or 6,065 hours. Cooling degree days is uh, 1,941 hours. So you can see we are a heating dominant climate in Pueblo. So this just kind of gives you a grasp and an overview of our local conditions. And we're about 5,000 feet above sea level. There are other heat pump installations within the area, uh, multiple residential. The Maple Leaf Clinic in Pueblo is one of note. Whenever we got started on this project back in 2019, the ownership and operations maintenance folks weren't sure if they wanted to pursue ground source heat pump. It sounded kind of spooky and a little mysterious to them. So Dr. Donaldchuk invited the O&M team over and uh, Terry Proffer and myself toured them through that clinic. And we met with Dr. Donaldchuk on that and he put them at ease. They were able to see the systems, touch it, feel it, gain a level of comfort that they didn't have. And it gave them the confidence to go forward with this stuff. So I would say on these, have those local resources that we can use. Don't design in a vacuum. Um, all of us geo junkies really enjoy this stuff. We enjoy sharing this information. A lot of these building owners enjoy sharing it as well. We've got uh, several schools in the area, the Pueblo Zoo. So be aware of local installations in your area. General drilling conditions for Pueblo, very favorable. Um, alternating sandstone and shales. Uh, we don't really have ugly drilling conditions in this area. No geologic reasons for not going too deep. So we started off thinking about 400 feet. We wound up going 500 feet thanks to our driller saying, uh, no problem. It'd be beneficial to go 500 feet and have 
uh, fewer holes. Uh, TC values typically vary between 1.1 and greater. Undisturbed soil temperatures are warmer for deeper holes, about 65 degrees plus, which was uh, very nice for this area, especially being heating dominant. And then production rates typically around two bores per day per rig. So with that, let's get on into, that's kind of an overview of climate and geology for the area. Pueblo Community Health Clinics is a nonprofit organization as federally qualified health healthcare clinic. So the interesting thing about the East Side Clinic is it specifically serves the lowest income zip code in Colorado. So for them to have an opportunity to have this building is pretty cool. So uh, they, it, we put this zero energy clinic in the area of greatest need in the state of Colorado. In order to move this project forward, they needed a board vision, a community vision, and a business case. So I dealt a lot with the CFO, uh, Justin McCarthy, at the beginning of this project. They didn't know they were going to go the zero energy route until one of the uh, shareholders, his name is escaping me now, stood up in, in one of their board meetings and said, what are you going to do about zero energy? And the owner and the architect and the engineers looked at each other and they said, we don't know. And then they said, uh, why don't you talk to Corey? We'll, uh, we'll come up with something. So this was really driven by the board on this project. And a lot of times I tell, fo if the, I tell folks, if the owner's not interested in driving this, it's probably not for them. Uh, none of us have the energy to fight this all the way through. But when we do, it's extremely successful. Everyone's excited about it. So getting owner buy-in is extremely important. Establishing a community vision, how we help the community, and then building a business case. And the bulk of this talk is going to be about building a business case for it because we do have a year and a half worth of operations information in order to share with you guys. Uh, the case uh, for this has really pushed on medical office buildings. I don't know how many folks have a lot of involvement in the medical world, but medical construction has lagged behind on energy efficiency for a long time, which is fine. Their primary focus is patient care. But if we do this right, we can help support these customers by uh, reducing their operating costs, allowing them to spend more money on patient care. So this is an article from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in January of 2019. Since then, we've seen a lot of push on medical facilities to go towards zero energy or low energy. The city of Pueblo, the part of the community case, uh, they have a goal to be 100% renewable energy by 2035, and they're the 22nd city in the U.S. to commit to completely renewable energy re resources. Project overview, I'm going to go through this fairly quick. We're going to look at just kind of the architecture, how this building looks, overview of the building, new construction. Again, I got involved in 2019. Construction was completed in uh, on January, first patient day was January 10th of 2021. Uh, so that gives you a good idea. I'm sorry, 2022. That gives you a good idea of the timeline, fairly new facility. Uh, so super exciting to be able to share this with you all. 64,000 square feet, 52 exam rooms with shell space for expansion to 78 full range of medical services, including dental, a laboratory, pharmacy, and behavioral health. So a pharmacy, this is a non-compounding pharmacy, but they still have some continuous 24-7 loads in it that make it a little more uh, cooling dominant than you would typically see. The site here, it was an old Safeway uh, that hadn't been opened for 
I think 20 years, it was growing up, uh, weeds through the asphalt. So it was exciting to see this kind of beautification of the area. Here's our building. Here's photographs of it. These are not rendering. So it's a fairly unassuming building. I think it's a good looking building, but you don't walk up to it and think zero energy. So you can see the shading devices on the east and south faces here. We'll talk more about that. Initially during design, we set some overarching goals. Uh, so I think it's important to set quick goals for the overall project at the beginning. Uh, Proverbs says, where there's no vision, the people are scattered, right? So if we can cast a quick vision for this project, we get people on board working in the same direction um, and it has amazing results. So our initial goals were 50% energy reduction, 66,000 annual energy savings, and pursuing a zero energy verification looked at 280 kW of PV arrays and two times code required thermal insulation. First floor, lobby, administrative areas, clinical spaces, lab, and pharmacy. And actually, if you look right here, this is our humble mechanical room. It's about 180 square feet with pumps, and we'll go a little more into that as we go on. Here's photographs from inside. Uh, this is the first floor. You see we have a three-story uh, open space that's largely lit uh, with natural light. Second floor, more clinical space, and we have dental and behavioral health up there. We have open concept for offices. So most of the offices are shared by uh, clinical providers. So they are able to bring in good daylight from outside and the lighting performance of this facility was exceptional. Third floor is largely administrative meeting spaces. And then you can see that shell space for uh, future expansion. So, these are, yeah, so standing up there is uh, Jason Pitts. He's the new CFO. He was, he was the uh, director of clinical operations at the time, but super exciting. All right, the process, the construction process. Again, we got involved pre-design 2019. Schematic design came to fruition October of 2019. That's when we're really committed to uh, the geothermal approach. Design development is whenever we did the thermal conductivity testing, which we will definitely advocate for every time. We do have local projects where we have a good understanding of the lithology and the performance of the ground that we're going to see there. But if we don't do a ground source or, or a thermal conductivity test for our specific area, uh, we're kind of playing with fire there. So always encourage you to get a, a thermal conductivity test somewhere between that schematic design and design development phase, your design uh, process. So it really solidifies, helps you be more aggressive on the sizing of your bore field, just because you have a higher level of confidence in the results. We got into uh, construction in 2020, which is uh, pretty fascinating. We had to do some shifts there in 2020. I, My role on this project, I was the commissioning provider, but I also... Uh, did quite a bit of the design review and uh, supporting the mechanical engineers on the development of the ground source heat pump system. So we looked at energy performance uh, verification. We looked at the new buildings institute. 
for practical zero energy. The clinic, it's a nonprofit clinic. They didn't want to spend money on a certification. They were more interested in the actual results of the process. So we found uh, the New Buildings Institute is basically a database that tracks zero or low energy facilities. They work alongside NREL. It's a great resource if you're curious about energy performance of facilities in your area or by specific functional use. So they looked at verification, not certification, which is based upon 12 months of operational data. Actual utility bills should be actually tangible to be able to see if we accomplished zero energy or if we didn't. You can see here's a little bit of the results. We did accomplish it. We were the very first healthcare inpatient or outpatient to hit verified zero energy. We were in a race with 11 others. It started off eight others and uh, we thought it would be close, but so far no one else has, has gotten there. So we're excited to be able to show that to you guys. And I would encourage you to look at that getting to zero database from MBI. All right, here we go. Roadmap to zero energy, zero energy buildings. So if we have sustainable design, energy efficiency and renewable energy, those three combine to identify our zero energy potential. We can make any building zero energy, but can we do it practically? Sustainable, sustainable facilities don't have to be complex or expensive. We'll make it the case for that. I love this quote, technical skills and mastery of complexity, while creativity is a mastery of simplicity. If there's a quote to talk about geothermal or closed couple <laughs> ground source heat pump systems, I think that's it. I love the simplicity of ground source heat pump systems and the opportunities they provide for us. So, <coughs> excuse me, whenever we look at these systems, I think it's extremely important one of the first things we look at, especially with someone like uh, Pueblo Community Health Clinics who have multiple clinics around Pueblo, what is the energy performance of their existing facility portfolio? How do they use energy? What do their operating schedules look like? We need to understand what they've got and how they use energy in order to make better decisions going forward through design. So we studied four existing clinics that they had. You can see on the right-hand side, these are smaller clinics, 17,000, 14,000, and 5,000 square feet. We studied those, but we're building a 64,000 square foot clinic, so they don't have a whole lot of bearing on this, but it's interesting. We're going to talk a lot about EUI, which I don't know if everyone knows, EUI energy utilization index is terms of KBTU per square foot per year. And it talks about the amount of energy a building uses per square foot per year. Lower is better. It's like golf scoring. So these EUIs we use to normalize buildings and kind of give a miles per gallon rating for these buildings. So you can see their existing facilities, their smaller ones were operating between uh, 68 and 80 kBTU per square foot per year. And then we have energy cost index, which is dollars per square foot per year. This is the real tangible piece. And oftentimes in our world, people are getting, in, in my opinion, too caught up in energy or carbon and they have, don't look at the cost. If we're gonna help people, it's important that we look at all three legs of this stool. And if we reduce cost, we are directly helping people. So we know ground source heat pump is a great opportunity to reduce cost and energy. So, all right, we had those three smaller clinics, the Colorado clinic, was 47,000 square feet. It was constructed in 2012. It provided a great baseline facility to compare our results 
for this new project too. They had an EUI of 55 and a half and a site cost index of $1.64 per square foot per year. This building was operating quite well. So an average medical office building, according to Energy Star, is operating at about 107 kBTU per square foot per year. So our initial goal is a 50% energy reduction. If we set that against Energy Star, we would see they already hit it in 2012. That's not an aggressive enough goal. We can do that. That building is uh, natural gas boilers, uh, large air handlers, and hydronic reheat through VAV boxes. So we have to step up our game because this customer already does pretty good at using energy. So we took our goal then from 50% savings to get them down to 55 or down to 50 kBTU per square foot per year to 30% savings over the Colorado Clinic to get them into the upper 30s. And then what you can see here <laughs> is when we cast a vision early and we are all working towards it, we continuously improve the results. What you see here in this spike, this is, this is the results of our goal setting and energy modeling through the whole project. Um, what you see this spike here is a recalibration of our baseline to make sure we weren't getting too out of whack before we did a final uh, detailed analysis and wound up at a goal of 22 kBTU per square foot per year. So set clear goals, start at the beginning, develop the design properly, and you're gonna see this continuous decrease in your energy consumption and your costs. Get your team buy-in. Owner leadership is extremely important. Anytime we pursue these zero energy thing um, on the ground source heat pump side of things, I don't know why there's continuously, it seems like some resistance to it. Um, so to have the owner in your court on this just helps provide that energy and that direction and that vision to these processes. With owner leadership, these projects do go forward. Education, and that's what IGSPA is all, all about, right? A lot, of our, uh, a lot of our responsibility in these projects to make them come to fruition is education. Education for our peers, education for the owners, education for the contractors executing the work. And through education, we get folks on board with this stuff. And when everyone's working in the same direction, we get amazing results. Define operational expectations. Don't exclude your operations and maintenance staff in your design decisions early on in the project. And then incorporate measurement and verification. So many times we tell people what we're going to do. Once the project is done, everyone goes away. We don't look back at how did it actually perform? So it's a unique opportunity that we have, especially in this uh, technology realm with uh, ground source heat pumps that, man, we can show them the results from this. So if we're not doing measurement and verification, we should. You guys will be blown away with how these buildings are performing compared to traditional technology. Actual integrated design. So <laughs> whenever we set the goal at 30% better than that Colorado clinic, we start looking at uh, integrated design procedures and we assign performance goals for the architect. So one thing I want to point out here, we'll go over, we set a baseline performance parameter for every component of the building, from the building envelope to the electrical systems to the mechanical system and the plumbing system. And then these goals go out to each individual designer. So we establish baseline performance requirements, either from ASHRAE 90.1 Appendix G, or in this case, we did 90.1 Appendix G, except where their Colorado Clinic exceeded those values. And then we use the Colorado Clinic as baseline. 
And then our initial design goals, if we're targeting 30% overall, super simple. We just took 30% performance improvement over the baseline and assigned each component a 30% improvement over that. And then we send those goals out to the design team. And we do this for the building envelope. We do it for internal loads. So we even had the clinic look at their autoclaves, their refrigerators, their screens, their lab equipment to improve energy consumption there. We sent out goals to the electrical engineer for lighting power density for watts per square foot. Huge win on this project. We actually got it designed at 0.42 watts per square foot average, which is incredible. We included the site lighting. We looked at the HVAC equipment and we assigned goals to every discipline and each primary component that contributes to energy consumption in a building. What happens whenever we take these and we get buy-in from the design team and the operations and maintenance staff we took these overarching goals, 30% better than the baseline. We break it out to very discipline and component specific requirements. The design team and operations staff responds back to us and tells us what they can do. If they hit each line or don't hit each line, it's not as important as setting the goals and then them telling the truth on what they're going to do. And whenever they report back to us, we find that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. When everyone's participated in this effort, we ultimately wound up at 58% energy savings and 37% cost savings. That's pretty incredible shift, right? So just by taking these simple steps, setting goals specific to the discipline, and then getting reporting back on what they could accomplish and what they couldn't accomplish on each component. When we put it all back together, we get better results than expected. And I'll tell you anecdotally, I've had this, we've done this, I've been doing this since 2012, using this specific formula to do it. And every time, whenever we put it back together, we get better results. So one thing we incorporated in this project is we did energy modeling along the way, which was kind of fun because it allowed us to model the building envelope impact, the lighting impact, and our HVAC systems impact independently. So remember our equation was, uh, Energy, uh, sustainable design plus energy efficiency plus renewable energy equals our zero energy potential. The order of operations there is, is extremely important. We start with a sustainable design. We start with the envelope and the architecture of a building, increasing uh, wall value, wall R values, taken a special look at the glazing on this project. We're using fiberglass windows with a U, a U value of less than 0.2 and a solar heat gain coefficient of less than 0.2. We worked with the architect to size the height above the windows and the depth of those overhangs to really take credit for that low winter sun and to block out that high summer sun. But then we plugged it into an energy model and we were able to let the architect know your piece of this process accomplished 28% energy savings and 15% cost saving. The lighting, the electrical folks, they took us their lighting improvements upon the envelope improvements, got us to 38% energy savings and 32% cost saving. Now, <laughs> remember our baseline building is gas and electric, and we're looking at energy savings, but we also have to look at cost savings. So in order to get our HVAC systems over the hump to both save energy and dollars, we have to look at something uh, less than traditional. 
So our baseline building was boilers and VAV reheat. We look at switching that over to all electric, no on-site combustion. So we looked at ground source heat pump systems. I'm a geo junkie, so I always try to push it a little bit and see what kind of interest the owner has. And if they got a little bit of interest, man, we're running with it. <laughs> so, but this really demonstrates for you how we're able to take that thermal energy, that natural gas that costs less per unit of energy than electricity, and then really reduce the amount of energy consumption so drastically that we continue to have a dollar increase in our performance, even going to all electric. So whenever we introduce the ground source heat pump and energy recovery uh, ventilation systems into this facility, we wound up at 58% energy savings and 37% cost saving. This is all projected, right? These are projected values. So we were looking at an annual cost of $59,000. All right, let's bear this in mind. And an EUI of 22.1. This $59,000 is prior to, this is just to this point. So we haven't looked at that last piece, that renewable energy piece. So we look at on-site renewable energies. Sustainable design plus energy efficiency. So electrical HVAC is the energy efficiency piece. And then uh, on-site renewable energy, that's our PV. You and I know this to be ground source heat pumps and PV, but uh, we'll keep it simple for everyone else. And the visible piece, this uh, on-site uh, solar array is that on-site renewable energy. But if we've done our job on the first two legs of this equation, we're able to reduce the size of our PV array, our on-site renewable energy consumption. So these are photos while construction was in process of the rooftop array and the carport array that we had. So the PV array, if we looked at our baseline building, our PV array would have needed to be 465 kW as designed and as modeled, we got it down to 280 kW. So at $3 an installed watt, you can uh, do the math real quick there, right? $3 times the difference here times 1,000 equals your cost savings, your capital cost investment savings. I've done that math before, but I don't recall it right now off the top of my head. <laughs> um, and we, so by doing those first steps of the equation, we've reduced the overall size. We've made this a much more uh, palatable chunk in order for this nonprofit organization to purchase. And they actually purchased this directly. They are a nonprofit, so they didn't get a tax credit for it. Now, after 2023, nonprofits have an opportunity to get tax incentives directly for PV and geothermal systems. So uh, I hope you guys are all aware of that. I'm not going to talk about it much because it didn't impact this project, but do look for that. And if, if uh, you have questions, I can forward an article, Courtney. So we continue to measure and verify this. We set an initial target of 448,000 kilowatt hours per year production. We check it through the submittal process and we get 483,000 kilowatt hours of expected production produced. They hit about 450 kilowatt uh, megawatt hours or 450,000 kilowatt hours of production. So we continue to monitor this stuff. And like I said, every time we do, we see results better than we expected. You'll notice this produced is less than submitted. We found a a software update that took us six minute, six months to solve. Um, it took the PV contractor six minutes to correct it once we identified the problem. But anyhow, measurement and verification is important. On-site renewable energy also extends to our ground source heat pump. 
On this project, we did use a closed coupled ground source heat pump system with water to air heat pumps that are distributed throughout the building. So as you guys all know, the beauty of heat pumps is we're able to share heat around the building. So in this building, we have a long east-west axis. So we have a good southern exposure, a good northern exposure. We have quite a bit of the year that we're moving heat from the southern side and putting it into the north side. And uh, the building works beautifully. And then we size our ground loop for that additional heat rejection and heat absorption that we need outside of that. So for this 64,000 square foot building, we have 32 uh, holes, 500 foot deep. Our TC test results gave us 1.27 kV or BTUH per foot per degree Fahrenheit for our TC. Our undisturbed soil temperature was about 65.6, so in line with expectations. Our thermal diffusivity was 1.09 uh, square foot per day. So <coughs> that gives you the results and the size of the PV array. Our peak cooling, 49.3 tons. Our peak heating, uh, 377 kBTU. H. So you can see we did model our ground loop temp, so we're able to work with the clinic monthly, track their highs and lows on their water. Super fun. You guys, this is all you want to, yeah, this is great information. <laughs> we could spend a lot of time talking about this, but we'll save that for questions and answers. All right. So as we all know, it's important when we talk about geothermal versus traditional systems, we're not talking apples to apples. A traditional system, we'd be sized out about 570 square foot per ton. Or, yeah, about, about 500 square foot a ton and probably 30 BTUs per square foot per year or per square foot. In this project, our ground source heat pumps, because of the benefits to the envelope and the lighting, our equipment peaks, our sum of peaks is 570 square foot per ton and 15 BTUH per square foot, which is pretty incredible when you look at it. But then our ground loop is sized at 1300 square foot per ton and 5.9 BTUH per square foot. So if you, understand your loads versus your energy, you can do a lot with this stuff. Where people fall into a trap is if they look at, oh, I need only a 40 ton chiller for this 64,000 square foot building in order to compete with geothermal. That is not true. You actually need about a 90 ton chiller in order to properly cool this facility. So when folks are looking at traditional systems versus geothermal, we have to help them understand the difference in how we are able to share heat around the building and how that impacts the sizing of our total heat rejection and heat absorption that we need from the ground. Because the sizing of our ground loop is not equivalent to the sizing of a traditional uh, air-cooled or uh, gas-heated system. So these values, if you sized a chiller and a boiler at this, you would not be able to accomplish uh, thermal comfort, I can assure you. All right, our ground loop, super exciting. This was the first time we tried it. We did, uh, we had 32 holes. We did uh, eight holes on each header pair. And then we put an injection pump on each header pair. So these are our injection pumps. And then sitting down over here on the right-hand side, you can see our base mounted building distribution pumps. So these, these pumps circulate water through the ground loop. We're decoupled and we circulate this water 
over here through the building. So our distribution pumps, our secondary pumps that do the building distribution are much larger. There are two pumps and our ground loop pumps are decoupled because of that disparity that you see between our peak load and the total amount of energy that we need. So very important to understand our loads versus our energy. Uh, when I was a young engineer, I always said you can't use your load calcs for your energy model. As I got involved in geothermal, it blew my mind. And I said, now I say you should be using your load calcs for your energy modeling because uh, accurate loads can do both. All right. Uh, decouple your ground heat exchanger piping. We really enjoyed this uh, individual header pair injection system. We allow three of the loops to rest a lot of the time and one, one loop is carrying the load. So it's, it's kind of fun. We get really good temperatures off of it. We operate uh, very efficiently. Many times we're in this building and, and actually none of the injection loop pumps are running because they're not needing additional load. Uh, so I, if you're curious, I would encourage you to take a look at that route. And like I said, we don't design these things in a vacuum. This is a, an idea that we took from Montana State University and they took from someone else. So we kind of talk about these ideas and these approaches that we have, uh, the successes that we've had and, uh, share them with everyone. And hopefully, uh, we just continue making these buildings more efficient. So our injection pumps cycle routinely for even runtime. When one header pair uh, is operating, the other three pairs are idle and resting most of the time and they return to undisturbed soil conditions. So we do believe this had a major contribution to our energy performance here. We're gonna take a look at as designed, we looked at projected baseline results. So our baseline would have been uh, 55 and a half KBTU per square foot per year. Our cost index would have been $1.64 uh, per square foot per year from a baseline perspective for a total energy cost of $98,000 a year. To put this in perspective, uh, Colorado's average EUI for a medical office building is 106. KBTU per square foot per year. Their target for 2050 for 50% energy reductions is 53 KBTU per square foot per year. All right, our building was designed uh, for an EUI of 24.6 KBTU per square foot per year and a cost index of a dollar per square foot per year prior to the PV benefit. So we were looking at about $60,000 a year. And the PV benefit was going to give us an additional $30,000 a year. We did get $122,000 from the local utility, from Black Hills Energy. Uh, they were projected to give us $122,000. So these are projected results. So we design it. It goes into construction. We do the commissioning. We test it out educate the users and the public on operational intent, commissioning as quality assurance to validate construction meets operational and design intent. Measurement and verification is extremely important. Energy efficient facilities are efficiently operated. Here you can see a kiosk in the front that talks about the geothermal, right? Courtney, you and I were talking about this before. So we are sharing with the community some of the results of this project. This is a class of uh, from the community college down in Pueblo. We were able to take and tour through the facility. So our education continues uh, through this. So this is our outside air, our dedicated outside air energy recovery system for the building. That's their only outdoor equipment. Well, that and the lab hood exhaust there that you can see. Actual results. This is what we all want to see, actual results. So you told us what you thought you were going to do, how did it actually perform? All right, modeled 
this blue bar is how we modeled it to perform. This red bar is actual performance based upon uh, their utility bills. And if we finish December at less than zero, we accomplish zero energy. So we were pretty excited. Uh, lots of interesting information to extract from this. Our August peak demand for this 64,000 square foot building was 67 kW. The peak demand for the baseline clinic that's 47,000 square foot, one third smaller, was 162 kW in 2022. So we're all electric and we cut their peak demand, which we know is a significant part of the cost of energy, we cut their demand by more than half against a facility that's a third smaller. That's pretty amazing, right? We continue to monitor the PV array. We have real-time monitoring of the PV array. So I, because I'm a curious person, I look at this every day and see how we're doing. We've had like the rainiest June that I can remember. Um, so our results in June aren't that great, but the rest of the year, they're pretty fantastic. We wound up for the year consuming about uh, 22 kVTU, or, or I'm sorry, yeah, 22 and a half kVTU per square foot per year. So just incredible results, and we'll go over the cost. Ah, here we go. Yes, but how much did it cost? Projected results, remember, at the end of design, we looked at an EUI of 21.92, a cost index of 46 cents per square foot per year, a total energy cost of $29,000 once we took credit for uh, the PV, and then the local utility company's design incentive of 122000 Actual results, we had an EUI of 22.55. Yes. Technically, we didn't hit the 21.92. It's all good. We had really good results and we are ecstatic. Our cost index was 41 cents per square foot per year. The 64,000 square foot building cost them $26,500 for 2022 for their total utilities. That's incredible. Uh, local utilities efficient design incentive when they came out and evaluated the construction, they bumped up the incentive another four grand. So again, it's super fun to watch this if we track what we expect and then actual each step of the way, if we've cast a vision, we're seeing that the results are better than we thought. And then the utility company gave back to PCHC an additional $5,839 for them to apply to their other buildings because of their performance of this building. So in actuality, the 64,000 square foot building cost them $20,000 for the year. That's pretty awesome. And how much did it cost? All right. It took about a 6% premium over standard design in order to accomplish this. So the a uh, contractor, Brian Construction, did a cost analysis on their own. This wasn't uh, us engineers trying to advocate for it. And they came up with a $1.5 million added cost for this project to go to zero energy. 35% of that was to architectural, 27% to mechanical for our geothermal that we always hear is way too expensive and 38% for electrical, which includes the cost of the on-site uh, PV array. So this $24 million project cost $375 a square foot for medical office building, including the site development. Really good numbers. Again, this is construction 2020 and 2021. We've definitely seen cost increases. We were able to, to purchase some materials early here, but I do believe these percentages, especially this 6% premium 
is very applicable today. So it doesn't cost very much to get significantly down the way here. Uh, compared to the Colorado Clinic, we resulted in $103,000 a year savings plus the $6,000 benefit, payback 12.62 years. Compared to the building it replaced, which was operating, uh, which was only 17,500 square foot. If we took that and multiplied by their energy cost per year, we saved $200,000 a year in the first year with their comparison to their 2018 utilities, which is a seven year payback based upon the, the facility that this one replaced. Here's a picture of their utility bills. You can see all these zero kilowatt hours, pretty awesome. So we just had a couple minutes left, so I just want to ask a couple of quick questions, um, if we can. So yes. a, a quick one is, what's the highest and lowest entering water temperature that you've measured so far? Uh, it's in line with our with our expectations. So we're running between 40 and 85 degrees on our entering water temps. Okay. So we're a little conservative there, but uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Because sure. of that injection, approach, we're able to really control that. We do operate a lot at those extremes, but we're able to keep it there. So it's kind Great. of Great. Um, so you talked a lot about the community involvement and the involvement from the owner's perspective, but what are some of the most frequent challenges or reasons for hesitancy or uncertainty that you encounter in these geothermal projects and from the owner's side? And then how do you typically resolve them? Uh, from the owner's side, it would be perception on the cost. So the thing that they they see the cost of the ground loop as a total added cost over their basic construction cost. And they see that as an expense. They see the thermal conductivity testing during the design development phase as an unexpected expense. But if we can help show them the comparison to actual cost, it's a extremely beneficial. And then the other is operations and maintenance concerns. So projects that don't operate well are always much louder than projects that do. So we do have, we do have, uh, we have pushback from contractors and actually their preferred contractor on this for the general contractor side was adamantly opposed to ground source heat pump. And ultimately that's why they didn't get selected. So if your owner's on board, if that contractor would have been selected, we'd have had more battles than we had to push the geothermal. But having that direct ear and laying out the case and setting the vision, got the owner excited about it. They believed in the geothermal process and they pursued it. And because of that, it changed their decision on who that general contractor would be. Great. Um, another question is, which energy model tool was the team using in the design process to accurately model the energy reduction impact of the geothermal exchange system? I used, uh, I used Carrier's HAP program, um, but I've done it in Trace, or you can do it in eQuest. The important thing is to understand your loads and to understand that carrier train and those guys sell HVAC equipment and uh, to properly size your cooling side of things <laughs> because they can be super conservative on the cooling and a little less conservative on the heating side of things. So understanding realistic load balance is extremely important. But yeah, I use uh, carrier HAP on that. Great, one last question. Are the individual uh eight loops injected to the header via closely spaced tees or piped in a different configuration? Uh, they're, they're piped in a fairly traditional uh, configuration, a square field, 25 foot separation. We do have one loop that kind of didn't fit the regular rectangle, so it goes its own way. But operating these loops independently, we see very very uh, consistent temperatures. So we didn't get too crazy on the loop geometry, if you will. Sure, so the loop field's more traditional. It's just using them and how you control them in the building that's a little unique. Yeah. Very cool. I, 
Well, this has been wonderful. I think that talking about that cost overall, that it was really only a 6% increase to the total construction project and what you were able to accomplish is incredible. I don't think that we ever give enough credit to really, it's not that huge of an impact when you actually get down to the end of the day. So I thought that was it's just awesome information. It's, uh, it's cool to have that back, right? Have that oh. feedback back and then continue. The CFO was our biggest uh, advocate to start off. His name was Justin McCarthy. When he retired, they renamed the mechanical room after him because he was the one sending me the utility bills with his own analysis of the results. So it, it, that was super cool to have uh, someone who was against geothermal and then to become our greatest advocate for the process. That is incredible. We will have to uh, pick your brain and put together like an official case study to put out because this is just to have this breadth of information is, is just outstanding. Uh, so we want to thank you, Corey, today so much for uh, sharing with us the information on this project. Uh, and as usual, this will be up on our YouTube channel. This whole thing has been recorded. Uh, if there were any questions in the chat that we did miss, we will try and answer those with Corey after the fact. But I want to thank everyone for attending today, and we look forward to seeing everyone at the next event. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.